Hello there, everybody, and welcome to a, a, an interesting discussion, hopefully, about a very interesting and worthwhile topic. Um, I'm joined by two special guests, one returning, one new to the channel. Hello there, Tracy. Hello there, Ryan. Hello. Hi there. Hello there. So, um, for anyone who doesn't know who you are, uh, a brief explanation of, uh, of yourself, be it as brief or as uh, expansive as you wish. Firstly, uh, hello there, Tracy. <laughs> Hey, so I think most folks know me from my um, prior work with uh, Atheist Community of Austin and some of their programs, and I believe that's kind of what got me um, connected to you in the first place, Kevin, was my break with that group and, and all of that. Um, and then after I'd left, uh, the Truth and Transparency Foundation reached out, said they were um, looking for supporters, uh, and I went ahead and agreed to help them support their mission, which is about religious accountability, because in the United States, uh, we have a situation where nonprofit status is granted to organizations that do public good, but church get that, a church will get that nonprofit status or any religious institution without actually demonstrating a public good. And so the other thing is they don't have to show quite as much transparency as other groups that get that same status of a tax, you know, tax deductible status. And so what TTF is trying to do is to sort of augment that lack of transparency by saying they will be the, the transparency outlet. So if people send them document, documents or um, evidence of any kind of wrongdoing or corruption or abuse that's happening within these churches, they go ahead and investigate that, try to do their best to vet and confirm that it's you know real or not real, um, and then they will publish uh, as they feel is, I guess, best in the situation for everyone concerned. But they've published different pieces about sexual abuse, about financial, um, I don't want to say financial abuse, but, but like finance uh, transparency, I guess, that was very shocking. Um, on, on a level with, with Mormons, for example. And I think the sex abuse case was with the Jehovah Witness situation. We, yeah. yeah we've, and, had both, but, we've had both on both sides of the religious spectrum. Yeah, so they, they do, what they're doing is sort of like um, picking up the slack where our government decided that religious, religious institutions don't have to be transparent. TTF has stepped in and said, we will be that transparency. And so I felt like that was a good mission. Uh, and I will let, I think, Ryan go on then and talk about it because he's the person that kind of started this whole ball of, you know, r rolling uh, back when. And so this yeah. is kind of his baby. Yes, Ryan, hello there. Welcome to the channel. Tell us a little bit about uh, you hey. and a little bit about um, uh, the truth and transparency. Yeah, uh, I, Tracy did a pretty good job there of uh, summing it up. But uh, yeah, I... Um... I, I am a, an ex-Mormon, former Mormon, maybe your viewers have heard of the Mormon Church. Um, I left the Mormon Church about eight, uh, seven years ago, uh, approximately, and um, somewhere along the way I kind of fell backwards uh, into this opportunity to, to help promote transparency, initially within Mormonism, because that was kind of the sphere that I was operating in at the time we we had a website called Mormon leaks and we had a lot of um, success there in in producing some very newsworthy articles and, and posts if you will um, and sort of the demand of people contacting us about other religions uh, especially from you know former members of the Jehovah's Witnesses kind of caused us to to want to broaden our, our coverage to all religions and that's kind of how the Truth and Transparency Foundation came about. Um, so, you know, we're a nonprofit newsroom that does investigative reporting to, like, like Tracy said, our focus is to highlight areas where there's a lack of transparency in religion. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times that, that revolves around sex abuse, unfortunately. Uh, that's definitely like the, the hardest topic to report on sometimes. Um, but it also does involve uh, financial things and, you know, um, whether it be financial improprieties, which we have reported a little bit on, but, uh, you know, but more so just sort of um, financial transparency, like, like Tracy said. For example, one of our biggest leaks was um, the, um, the, the discovery of 32 
billion dollars in the U.S. stock market that was owned by the Mormon Church, which is previously unknown to exist. Um, wow. So you know things like that. Are, yeah, things like that are important. <laughs> Because, you know, like the Mormon Church, a lot of people, even that don't know a lot about the Mormon Church, like they say, oh, the Mormon Church, yeah, that's a really wealthy church out of Utah. Like they'll know that much maybe. They'll know it's a wealthy church. But oftentimes they don't know exactly what that word wealthy means. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that's... most of them don't think it – most of them don't think it means $32 billion in the stock market. <laughs> yeah, $32 billion, um, is, that's not chump change. That's a lot of money. It, it's not chump change, and it's also just barely scratching the surface to really the assets that they have, because because literally that is only U.S. stock market investments. That's not pr property. It's not foreign markets. It's not bonds. It's not you know all these other things that you know businesses that the Mormon Church has private businesses. It's none of that. So when we say thirty-two billion, which is a lot of money, that's it, it's probably like maybe you know a quarter probably depending on the estimates you know a quarter or a fifth of what of what their total net worth is wow that's that's a hell of a lot of money and i bet, <laughs> yeah. I, bet, I, bet you, I bet you can buy some politicians with that kind of money yeah i mean you know yeah sure i mean i don't know that <laughs> i don't want to get into any more legal kinds of things but <laughs> i don't want to get into any more legal problems that don't have to I'm just... But if anybody has documents about but, but, politicians yeah. who've been bought, yeah. please well, send them all. <laughs> and I think I think what's clear is when you do have that kind of money, you can influence politicians in ways that are perfectly legal. Yeah. So um, right. you well, know, let's not with, forget that as well. Yeah, especially now with uh, dark money in super PACs and all sorts, you don't even have to declare. Sure. Anything. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Sure. Right. Exactly. So, I right. mean, the and church these... just. You know, just oh, as an example, just... the Mormon Church owns, I can't remember the exact number, but it's something like 17 or 20 radio stations around the country. Wow. You know, just as an example. That's, yeah, and they well, create that's... wedge. I mean, they'll, you create a wedge issue, you know, something like women's reproductive health and abortion. You make that an issue and then suddenly you have this code for how to vote. Right. So you don't have to stand up and say this is the politician that our church supports, which would be completely not legal. Um, they would lose their tax status for that. But they can say this is where we are on this issue. And that is as much code as is required to say this is the politician we support. Yeah, indeed. And again, it, it just goes to show the lack of oversight that people are allowed to get away with that in, in churches and things. Um, yes. So, uh, in terms of, we're about to talk now about the uh, the actual lawsuit, the the reason that this, we've convened mm -hmm. this meeting. Um, uh, there's a link below if you want to go and uh, financially aid uh, the Truth and Transparency in their fight, uh, just to be able to, uh, re you know, have that oversight, which is basic journalistic yeah. freedom, which should be hopefully guaranteed under the U.S. Um, Constitution. But who knows? We'll see. Um, so yeah, go and follow that link if you want to, if you're able to um, to give money and all the rest of it. But uh, in lieu of that, uh, of course, um, sharing this and the story and talking about it is awesome as well. So I'll hand it over to Ryan as uh, the person who knows uh, most about this and most of it. Tell us, um, basically, tell us what happened, what what the story is here that the mm -hmm. um, church is trying to censor you. Sure, sure. Well, just some quick backstory to like sort of understand the context of what has happened. Um, we started uh, reporting on um, the Jehovah's Witnesses in, I, I believe it was in 2018, possibly late 2017. Late 2017, early 2018 is when, you know, our first stories about the Jehovah's Witnesses came out. Um, the very first one that we had was a series of internal memos, uh, maybe 30, 40 uh, back and forth documents uh, between the the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is Watchtower, that's sort of their church headquarters, and a local congregation where they were um, very clearly and unambiguously covering up a case of sex abuse um, involving three, three victims, uh, one perpetrator, three victims. So we report on that. That story got a lot of, of attention. Um, internet. I mean, I was giving interviews like to some newspaper in Lebanon 
<laughs> to show you kind of how far reach that particular story got. Um, and we started to get a lot of people sending in stuff and, and, and whatnot. So at, at some point we connected um, with a, with a guy named Jason Wynn, who at the time you know, we knew his name, but he was sort of anonymous behind the scenes guy. He ran a website called um, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I believe his website was called JW survey or something along those lines. And he had over the years amassed, over a hundred thousand files of documents from the the Jehovah's Witnesses Church. Things like, uh, you know, just internal manuals, memos, uh, I, I believe videos as well. Just all kinds of stuff. And and he had put them on this website, which was very popular among the ex Jehovah's Witnesses for them to go and read about, you know, the things that the Jehovah's Witnesses were were doing and keep up on that kind of stuff. And he was anonymous. And he, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, he he lives in um, Ireland, I believe, Ireland or Scotland, I can't remember which. And the Jehovah's Witnesses were able to use some legal maneuverings to find out his identity, and then they basically threatened him with a lawsuit. Um, and you know, he just didn't have the ability to go and fight that. So he reached out to us. Um, and, and again, at this point, he was an anonymous person. Nobody, very, very few people knew his identity. He reached out to us, um, and, and asked if we could help with these documents. So, you know, he, he sent them to us and, you know, we, we felt they were valuable and of public interest. And so we hosted them on our own servers, um, and made them available, uh, essentially in the same format he had been making them available. Now, in late 2018, he decided, you know, this transfer of documents had taken place. So we had over $100,000 or 100,000 documents, I should say, on our website now that we had gotten from him. And he felt it was time for him to sort of maybe, you know, take the, the mask off, if you will. Yeah. And he gave an interview to an outlet there in the UK, revealed himself and talked about how he had gotten us these documents, et cetera, et cetera. Well, within a matter of days, I believe it was, uh, from, from that article coming out, it was in short order anyway, uh, we got a, a DMCA takedown request, which is essentially a takedown order They uh, from the Jehovah's Witnesses. They identified a bunch of documents from this, you know, cache of documents. I don't remember how many they identified. They didn't identify all hundred thousand, but tens of maybe even a couple hundred documents and said, you're violating copyright. Um, take these down. Our attorney at the time um, responded with a letter, um, you know, basically explaining why, why we, why these fell under fair use and, you know, that we would be, declining their offer to take them down. <laughs> I say that jokingly. Um, <laughs> um, and, and so then we didn't hear from them again. Um, we had had this run in already with the Mormon church on a similar situation and with a, uh, some private citizens that were not officially part of, of the organization of the Mormon church um, where our simple declaration, you know, back to the, of you know this is fair use had worked and we didn't hear from the Jehovah's Witnesses for a long long time over a year so we just kind of assumed they also you know realized they were gonna have to move on for another day until uh, just about uh, two months ago uh, six weeks ago or so we found out that they had filed a lawsuit against us um, uh, for these these videos now what is interesting to me uh, you know, I, maybe some people will find this interesting, is this lawsuit uh, doesn't even claim any of the of the files that they had asked us before to take down, that they were saying that we had violated copyright. They don't even mention any of those um, files as us having broken copyright. They do mention it in the context of the history of the case. They say that we had ignored their previous requests. But these videos that they have you know, are suing us over our videos that we actually posted after 
the last DMCA takedown. So these are videos that um, they're from um, these regional conferences that the Jehovah's Witnesses do every year. Their top leaders travel the world to like, you know, they rent out like arenas, like a basketball or a soccer stadium or whatever. And anybody is invited to come free of charge. They don't charge entry to these. Although I, I think it's generally just members of the Jehovah's Witness Church that go, even though it's technically open to the public. And they give these uh, these speeches and they show, along with the presentations that they give, uh, they have these videos that will accompany um, the presentations. And so um, these videos and questions are those videos that they show at these um recent regional conferences uh from i believe the two summer from the 2018 and summer from the 2019 conference and <clears throat> they were somebody I, i'm not even 100 percent sure who uh had posted them independent of us we had nothing to do with this on a russian website that's like the russian version of youtube it's yeah. called RuTube. Which is <laughs> okay. yeah, well played to RuTube on that. That's a good, that's a solid right. naming, yeah. Yeah, I, I had personally never heard of RuTube until, you know, I found out about these videos, but apparently it's the Russian version of the of the site. I don't think it's owned by Google in any way. It's like a knockoff of, of YouTube, I believe. Um and so this somebody had posted these videos to that Russian YouTube site. And the Jehovah's Witnesses had sent a, a, a takedown notice to that Russian YouTube site, and they actually complied with it and forced removed the videos from the user's account. Um, you know, at that point, much like uh, the way Jason Wynn contacted us for his 100,000 plus documents, um, we were contacted about these videos and asked, you know, hey, look, the, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to get these taken down. Are you guys interested? And then we wrote an article, Ethan Dodge, who, who does the organization with me, my co-founder, he wrote an article, which I believe you've linked in the description of this video if people want yes. to read it. Yeah, yeah. links and to it kind of out, information yeah. is all uh, in the description box if you want to go and check it out. Yeah. In the article, he outlines the saga that I just kind of briefly touched on with the Russian YouTube and then, you know, links people who want to see these videos to see what they're all about. So that was in May or so, I believe, of, of 2019 that that article came out and those videos. And so a year later, uh, this April is when they filed the lawsuit. And they didn't, um, it, they don't even uh, claim copyright on necessarily everything. Um, there's, I think, 70... 74 or 78 videos that they have um, claimed we are breaking copyright on, um, which is, you know, I don't know what, well, I mean, I can only speculate as to why they chose these videos, and not others, um, you know, but that that's kind of the, the Cliff's Notes version yeah. of what's going on. You know, if you have any, like, questions about any aspects of that, you want to, like, do a deeper dive in, I'm happy to answer yeah, uh, um, that's the general background. Yeah, there's some. It, I mean, for staff, seventy-eight videos. How many videos in total have you published of of theirs? Because that seems like a lot of. I mean, how much are they producing yeah. for these? This is incredible. Yeah, I couldn't even. We have so many videos of theirs that I I really couldn't even give you an accurate account. Oh wow! But it's it's well it's well over the number that they're suing us for, and these videos are professionally produced in house by them. Um. Some of the videos that we have up that are not included in the lawsuit are actually unfinished. So, for example, they're like um, uh, there'll be like a roundtable discussion of top leaders with a green screen that they haven't superimposed an image onto yet. Okay. And there's like a little ticker tape at the top with like, you know, you can kind of see it's like a pre-production or like a post-production, like, you know, on the editing floor type of a, a clip that somehow somebody got a hold of. Um, and some of them are the finished product. Um, if you look at the the videos, the bulk, possibly even you could say all of the videos that they have identified in their lawsuit by themselves are very innocuous videos, right? And if somebody were to go, if somebody were to just go and click on one of the videos and watch it, I, I, I think a lot of people, without any context around it, a lot of people would just be like, wait a minute, 
why is this on a website and why are they claiming it's newsworthy and you know what I mean? It's it, yeah. so I it, I think they've been a little bit smart in that regards of of going through and picking out the most innocuous videos to to sort of lay their copyright claim on. Yeah, so, uh, when so, in fact they have a registered copyright on all of the videos. Yeah, but they don't want to draw attention to the somewhat more sinister elements of their uh, productions. Potentially, yeah, th- those are your, those are your words, not mine. Indeed, indeed they are. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be sued. But it's just an opinion. No, no, I'm just. I was kidding. I yeah. was kidding. No, yeah. I, look, I, yeah, that definitely goes into it. You know, I don't want to say that that's exclusively the reason why they didn't choose some of the other videos, but. But I do think if they, you know, if there was a video that hinted on shunning, uh, which there are, you know, they're they're probably not going to try to go and claim that we didn't have the uh, duty to report on something like that. Yeah, there are. I mean, there are some very very troubling elements um, to some of the uh, stuff, like you say about shunning. Basically, it's shunning. Yeah. It's bordering, but again, bordering. It's just an opinion on mm. the mentality of cults where they try and separate off people from wider um, support networks that might contradict the central core message of the cult leadership potentially yeah no for sure yeah absolutely so that's that's why i say they might not want to draw attention to something like that and maybe to the more innocuous because some of them just appear to be sort of like uh, business productions like i just really bland there's nothing really being yeah. said of any note. And you think, why are they even showing this to people? Well, I don't even get the purpose of this <laughs> right. particularly, but yeah. you know. But it's it's very strict. I agree. So what? So, um, in terms of the uh, videos themselves, they're not particularly um, newsworthy or noteworthy. Uh, the ones that the uh, you're being sued for. But uh, I wonder if you would be prepared, and if you are, uh, to speculate on uh, whether there this is seems like it's part of a pattern of abuse on behalf of the church of free speech and journalistic freedom that they're essentially trying to silence you because they don't think you're uh, financially able to fight what is i don't know if it's legally uh, technically uh, falls under frivolous but it seems to me a pretty frivolous mm-hmm. law so to best but you have to financially be able to sub- yeah. to fight that yeah yeah i mean as far as the frivolous goes um I won't, you know, I don't think the door is completely shut on this, but as of right now, based on what we know, you know, it seems like it's probably not going to be able to fall into a category of frivolous, at least from a legal standpoint. Yeah. Um, You know, maybe something comes out that we don't know right now that would, you know, potentially change that assessment. But but I will say that, you know, there is sort of a well-documented history um, that you can easily uh, read about online of... The Jehovah's Witnesses using the courts to silence critics. Mm. Now, usually, the, this uh, you'll see this in in the form of them trying to silence just former members that are out there on the internet. Um, you know, I don't know if you'll necessarily find a lot of evidence of them trying to silence actual news organizations. Although our news organization is somewhat unique in that regard, but. Um, you know, like there was recently a fairly well circulated case amongst the ex Mormons, or not ex Mormons, sorry, the ex Jehovah's Witnesses, um, where there was a guy who posted something on Reddit. I don't even know what it was. It had nothing to do with us, but he posted something, some sort of internal file from the Jehovah's Witnesses onto onto Reddit, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, tried to through a subpoena or some sort of DMCA action, they tried to force Reddit to disclose the identity of this person. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, and that you can read about this case online. It made, it made some smaller news outlets. Um, the, the, um, the person was able to fight it through a, a nonprofit group that helps with these kinds of things. And they were able to get the case uh, basically thrown out. Um, they were not the Joe's witnesses in that particular case were not successful, but you know, they, they are sometimes um, successful uh, not only in getting organizations to divulge, let's say the identity of people, but, but they're the most of the time, the way they're successful is simply by employing their deep pockets. And just yeah. the mere fact that they, they can file a lawsuit is sometimes enough because, you know, you can say, well, I believe this is important to be out there. 
but it's not important enough for me to, you know, put my retirement at risk or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Absolutely. so, yeah. Yeah, I don't, so they do have a history of doing that, by the way. They do have a history of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that it's the deep pockets that's the issue because they can essentially financially yeah. bully people into silence. And there's, right. there's something phenomenally sinister about wanting to seek out the identity of people who have posted things. Like it's that's that seems to me an incredibly creepy precedent to set. Even if, like you say, yeah. if, if you're financially able to fight the court case, you probably will. Uh, be able to protect your anonymity, but a lot of people aren't in a situation where they can do so. It's in dealing like yourselves. Yeah. And finance. If if justice is predicated on on your ability to financially pay, and that's not really justice, it seems to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another thing I'd like to point out. I don't know. It may have come out in one of your questions or whatever. But one thing that's important to point out here is that these videos, while they are professionally produced, um, and uh, you know, it's not like just some camcorder home video type of a thing. Um, these are not videos that the Jehovah's Witnesses distribute to their members. They're not videos that the Jehovah's Witnesses sell to anybody. Um, and I would even go as far as to say I, I don't see any evidence that they're even videos that they use in their recruitment, which I'm not, you know, not even saying that that would change the legal argument of theirs. But but they I don't even think they can claim that these are videos that they use you know, actively in, in their recruitment. Um, so I, I just want to be clear that uh, when they claim that we are breaking copyright, um, you know, they are not claiming that we are infringing on their ability to, you know, make money or anything because they're not making money on these videos. Yeah. Right. There's no damages involved here. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we're not making money either, by the way. We don't monetize yeah, exactly. the videos, yeah, um, a... you know, yeah, sorry, I was just about to move on to that exact topic. Yeah, so there's no, yeah. um, there's no financial um, hit to either themselves or, and you, you yourselves yeah. are not making money from these videos. So the idea that this is somehow yeah. an infringement of their either their ability to, to earn money or even, like you say, recruit or anything like that, is frankly ridiculous. Yeah. Like you say, it might not legally fall and I don't... frivolous, but that seems pretty right. weak. You know. Well, and yeah, I and I think what bothers me about it is they literally show these videos for free to at conventions that are open to the public. I mean, it's just like they they are giving these things away publicly, and yet they're going to go to the wall for someone posting them publicly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah and, and I don't, and I don't, and I don't mean to say that the fact I don't want people to get confused. The fact that they're not. Uh, making money off of these or we're not making money does not completely exonerate us i do th that's definitely a point on our side of the argument right that's a point for us um but there are some other factors you know that have to be taken into consideration when you know when when looking at this so the the, the money making part is one aspect we're definitely on the winning side of that part of the argument you know there's other parts of the argument that that we will that we will have to sort of overcome and win yeah, but it, it seems to... I mean, like I said, I can't speak to the the exact wording of the law. And frankly, if this does fall mm -hmm. fall under the... If, if the court case were to go ahead and they were to win, I would suggest that means that the law is wrong rather than you being wrong, particularly. But even so, um, the yeah. the fact... Look, as, uh, as uh, Tracy rightly points out, that these are being shown to people, again, in publicly accessible uh, places for free, seems to me... You can't then turn around and say, "Well, you can't show that. That's outrageous. This is like amateur." Well, that seems a bit, a bit <laughs> ridiculous, frankly. Yeah, and we're crediting them. Nobody's denying that it's theirs. It's not like that. It's been posted at the website, and, and TTF is saying this is ours. You know what I mean? It's like they're they're fully, you know, credited with as the producer of the of the material. Indeed, yeah, well, yeah. quite literally, you're there saying this is what these people are producing, and here's potentially why it's problematic at the very least. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Um, that's that's the, uh, the the sort of the law case, uh, the law uh, suit. Which again, if you want to go and financially assist these fine people in fighting for basic freedom here, um, the link is below. Please go and help them in any way you can. Um, but in terms of the actual uh, yeah if i could if yeah, i can just touch on that real quick um yeah so you know we we need the first step is um 
is to make file a motion to dismiss, um, which we do not have the money to do right now. Um, that's going to cost somewhere between twenty and thirty thousand dollars just to get to a motion to dismiss. Um, and then you know the leftover money, which ultimately, even if we win, we actually might end up needing a little bit more than forty. But you know, forty will take us quite a ways. Um, because what will happen is if we win the motion to dismiss, which I, I, I do believe that we will, um, it's very likely that they will appeal that to the higher court. Um, at least our attorney told us that we should fully expect them to do that. Um, now, will the higher court hear the case? You know, will they be successful? You know, obviously we wouldn't know. But, you know, we have to be prepared um, for that, w even if we win this motion to dismiss. Um yeah, so you know we run on financial fumes, and anybody can go to our website and look at our financials. We publish them. Um, if there's something that somebody wants to know about, maybe you know more recent financial situation of ours, because obviously we only post them annually. Um, they're free. You know, people can contact me, and I'm happy to discuss the details of our finances. There's really not much to discuss, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, we, we, we've been running on financial fumes since we started. Um, this is not a job. Uh, Ethan, neither Ethan nor I make any money, um, any money. Like we don't even draw, I, you know, a lot of times, you know, churches will say their clergy don't make money when they get like a stipend. They use play with language. We're not playing with language here. We don't get a stipend, a salary, a, anything. <laughs> okay. Um, we have our own jobs and you know, that we have to balance with all of this. So, um, yeah, so we we really are in need of some donations, and the reason why this is important, and uh, Tracy touched on this, although it may have been before we went live, I don't know, but uh, one of the reasons why I would say that this is important is because a case like this is going to have an impact beyond us. Yeah, if we don't raise the money, and we fold, that that may not necessarily have an impact in the sense that it creates case law that can be used against other organizations, but it does embolden the Watchtower and other similar organizations to say, hey, look, we can bully people into submission. We've are, we've done it before. Here's just another example. And it gives them, it, like I said, it emboldens them and helps them with the roadmap of how to silence people like us. Um, the other thing is that uh, if we are able to actually fight this and go to court and let's say get the motion to dismiss or or maybe beyond that a summary judgment or whatever um this is important because it will it will establish case law that can be used in other cases where large powerful deep-pocketed organizations try to silence critics over some nonsense um this will help other small outlets like us in the future to curb this kind of bullying. So it, it, for a lot these reasons and many others, um, I hope people realize that this is an important case and this is not just about us trying to save our website. If we lose our website, okay, it's gonna suck. We'll lose it, our lives will go on, we'll come up with a new project, we'll do it better next time, you know, whatever. Um, but the more the the more sinister ramifications are what can the ripple effect that it can have uh on silencing other people indeed yeah um and there's obviously a broader uh context of attack on media at the moment with um the fact that we've seen during protests and things um journalists being attacked and arrested and uh, all kinds of uh, all manner of attacks on freedom of, of the press um and whilst this is obviously one small part of that I think it's important that wherever it's possible to fight back against that, we do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Absolutely. So, um, and the money adds up quickly, so people shouldn't think that you know their ten dollars or whatever doesn't help. It does. Okay, you 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 don't need that many people donating ten ten dollars each to get to a decent chunk of change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you can give absolutely any financial assistance, it all adds up, and it's all it's all useful. Yeah, absolutely.
Well, and I, I've been asking people as well if they're unable to donate, just spread the word, right? So just word. share the link. Even if you, if you know, I understand right now, especially with COVID hitting the planet and all these things going on, there's a there's a lot of, of, of places in need, right? I personally just posted an update to the, you know, aftermath of the Australian wildfires. So I get that, you know, the planet as a whole, there's a lot of places that need money. And on some level, this might seem like not that big a deal, um, and I can't really hammer somebody if they look at it that way, but it costs you nothing to share it, right? So this may not be your issue or the issue where you think that your limited funding should be going, but maybe there's some people on your feed and, and one of them, this is like an important issue for them. Maybe this impacts them in some way. Maybe their you know job is tied to something like this. And, um, but, or maybe they're just a religious person who actually thinks that transparency is a good thing and would like to see more transparency in their own religious organizations and they want to support this effort. So don't, uh, don't, don't, I'm not asking anybody to feel bad if this is not their particular thing, but I would ask to just please consider sharing out that link and just giving a little bit of an explanation as to, you know, who this might appeal to um, for others that may be interested in it. Indeed. Yes. It costs you nothing to share a link and uh, all the links are there um, below and you can go and check those out and share it out on your social media accounts and all the rest of it. Like you say, you never know who it might appeal to. Absolutely. Um, right. Yes. So in that's the, the lawsuit uh, and the transparency, because, again, it's good that an organisation called Truth and Transparency is transparent about its money, and you've uh, explained <laughs> yeah. that really rather well. Um, so uh, the the actual Jehovah's Witnesses themselves, though, there's they're, they're quite dark in some ways, aren't they? There's there's a number of issues. Uh, you, you touched upon this, the... Um, sexual assault thing I, I read uh, whilst researching for this the case of the uh, Royal Commission in Australia uh, where uh, was mm -hmm. it 1006 cases were investigated by the church themselves none of which were sent by the church to the secular authorities at all which means there's no oversight of institutional systematic rape and sexual assault uh, of well adults yeah. and minors yeah, one of the unique aspects to Jehovah's Witnesses that I really haven't seen in other organizations of their size is that they have done a really good job of convincing their members to never go to the police for anything. Um, and even in other religions that have a problem, you know, with dealing with sexual abuse, which of course there are other religions, we've covered cases you know involving the mormon church where the mormon church has fallen short um but they don't fall short it seems nearly as often and in such egregious ways in other organizations like the mormon church it seems because ultimately a lot of times the people if they don't get their the resolution they're looking for at church they do go to the authorities uh, because they don't have that stigma over the authorities the way the jehovah's witnesses do and in the one case that I referenced that was our first publication about the Jehovah's Witnesses, that was actually a big part of the back and forth between the local congregation and the headquarters. It was, don't get the local police involved. Um, that was explicitly stated in at least one or two of the of the memos uh, in the back and forth. Um, so it's uh, it, it's it's a really interesting aspect to the Jehovah's Witnesses belief system that um, that has these sort of ramifications when it comes to sex abuse. I mean, they probably didn't, you know, they they probably didn't intend it to be the way. I, I think they probably don't trust the police for other reasons. But this is one of those sort of consequences of that type of mentality of don't ever go to the government don't ever go to the police well all of a sudden you won't you you don't have these outside agencies coming in and holding criminals accountable yeah, yeah. unless you unless somebody posts your videos then go to the authorities right right yeah, <laughs> go well, get them. well you know <laughs> i'll tell say, you yeah. something that's i was just about to say yeah they they trust the authorities when it suits them yes yeah yeah i'll tell you a funny story that i've very rarely told so i don't know if this is an exclusive but it could be close to it <laughs> Um, when we published those papers, um, uh, those, those, those sexual abuse memos, we had no idea where they had come from really, or like how they were obtained. Um, we were dealing with like, not even like two 
uh, people removed. I think maybe three or four people removed from from the original, you know, source. But after we published those uh, documents and they got a lot of media traction, I got contacted one day by a police officer in the town where these memos took place, and he was calling me to, uh, and, you know, ask me who my source was. And I told him, well, I actually don't know. And even if I did, I obviously wouldn't tell you, which he was totally cool about, by the way, this police officer was very cool. He was just doing his job. But what had happened was uh, apparently the Jehovah's witnesses believed that somebody broke into the local church and stole the actual hard copy documents. Now, if whether or not that's true, I actually don't know. Okay. But the Jehovah's Witnesses apparently had some reason to believe that is what had happened. And they called the police and filed a police report that these documents about a sex abuse cover-up where they talk about not calling the police were supposedly stolen. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I, I'll just to sort of solidify the point that this police officer was actually a pretty good guy. Uh, he was much more interested in trying to figure out if the statute of limitations was still in play on these abuse. And he wanted to pursue that angle much more than he wanted to pursue the theft. So unfortunately the statute of limitations um, was up. There was a, one of the victims, it actually maybe wasn't up, but that victim, you know, I guess didn't want to talk to the police. They wanted to sort of keep it in the past, I guess. So uh, I wasn't really too much involved in that. But, you know, the police officer was, you know, he's like, well, I'm going to investigate this uh, theft. But if it leads me to find some, you know, sex assault, then that's fair game. Uh, but, yeah, it is interesting, like, to Tracy's point, you know, or they call the police when it's convenient. <laughs> you know? Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I don't know if those documents, I, I legitimately do not know if those documents were stolen from a church or not. I really don't. No, that's fair enough. And like you say, uh, you don't have to reveal your sources, and I think it's probably right that you don't. Yeah. Confidentiality yeah. is enormously important. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, in terms of uh, support from atheists, the atheist community more broadly, how has that gone? Have you got the word out to many people? Have, have you received positive <clears throat> feedback? Yeah, I, I think that a lot of our, the majority of our supporters are, are on some area of the atheist spectrum yeah um because most of our supporters are ex-mormons and ex jehovah's witnesses and those groups tend to produce a lot of atheists um i don't know you know how much if any traction we have in like specific atheist groups i don't know i'm not really involved in any like specific groups but in general atheists tend to receive our message well and tend to be our biggest supporters yeah but we do have supporters that are believers um you know we even have supporters i can't so much say on the jehovah's witness side but on the mormon side i can tell you unequivocally that we have supporters that are believing mormons we have received messages from plenty of them that'll say something along the lines of you know, I believe in the Mormon church. I love the Mormon church. I, I follow the Mormon church. I believe their one flaw is their lack of transparency. And thank you for what you're doing. I mean, I, I have more messages like that than I can count on two hands at least. So, I mean, there's a definitely a number of people like that, but, uh, but yeah, most of our supporters are going to be people who have, who feel disenfranchised or betrayed in some way by, you know, by a, a religion that they probably used to belong to. And that's, you know, that sort of shared experience is often what sort of brings people together to read the content we produce. Yeah. Now th that's a really important point, but also Tracy, can we see the cat? Oh, kitty. Um, she's not real f friendly. So I'll try to hold her up a bit. Can you see her? Oh, adorable. <laughs> She didn't like it when I grab her, but yeah, she's the newest addition. Oh, that's very well. um, that's, that's so nice. yeah, and and the videos I should note too, like um, you know, Ethan had sort of mentioned to me about the relevance of these videos in demonstrating the culture of the church, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure people understand that that's part of it. So it, like uh, like what Ryan was explaining is you have this kind of overall reporting and the overall release of these materials and some of them may seem dry and 
and um, municipal, but really it's it's a lar large picture that matters about the culture of the church. And I think um, last night, Kevin, I had sent you, when, when Ryan sent you the link to the whole sort of clearinghouse of the videos, I sent a little bit one that had a little bit more labels to it and said here's one I want you to check out especially because when I saw this one I just my jaw dropped right I couldn't even believe that it, it was it was almost like a, a parody of what you would think a cultish church would produce um, and I, I think you said you did get a chance to see that one it was the attack of Gog by Mag, Gog of Magog <laughs> or something and it was the whole point to the video was whatever the church tells you to do, you do it. You don't ask questions. And if it makes no sense or it even does like, you know, um, personal, I guess, causes personal issues for you, uh, you don't even ask. Like even asking is is some form of uh, satanic influence, right? Because that's their, the Gog of Magog, the attack of Ma Gog of Magog, that's what that is. It's, it's a a phrase that means to them like a satanic sort of demonic influence so what they're saying is that if you don't trust the church and you don't do what it says even if it doesn't make sense to you and if you even question it um that's that's satan working through you yeah. and i i'm just so stunned yeah i, I did yeah, i got a chance to watch uh, that that video and it's like you say it's almost a parody of a kind of uh, I, I can now understand perfectly well why uh, in in researching this, I constantly kept up with people referring to the leadership as totalitarian, and they absolutely are. <laughs> but on, on the you mentioned uh, Gog and Magog, um, a really weird uh, American political uh, thing was when at one meeting of the United Nations, apparently there was a meeting of uh, certain world leaders, and George Bush brought up Gog and Magog in the middle of a meeting about international affairs. That's a little bit terrifying. I mean, thankfully the world's evolved, yeah. but that's, yeah. The, the the power of that kind of silly, it's not even silly, it's sinister narrative is is much further than you might be comfortable with, frankly. There's a pretty good documentary on Netflix called The Family that deals with um, dominionist religious influence in U.S. politics and I think bleeding into global politics. I I just want to throw that out there if anybody's interested in, in finding out more. There's a lot of things that get said, like things that are spoken that seem like odd religious comments that sometimes the media will hit it and people will, will think, well, that that's weird. Why would someone say that? But after I saw that documentary, so many things that didn't make sense, suddenly I would hear it and be like, oh my God, now I know yeah. what that is. Yeah, yeah, Ted Cruz yeah, they, and his family are uh, dominionists, and if you look into their background, some of the things they believe are really, really creepy. Yeah, yeah. the the um, the thing that actually put me and and Mormon leaks on the map originally had to do with exposing the Mormon Church's influence in politics. the The very first thing that I leaked before we were really even an actual organization you know, uh, was 15 um, closed circuit videos from some, some board meetings at the at the Mormon church headquarters. I won't go into all the details here because it would take me too long. But the bottom line is, is that uh, those videos landed uh, a bunch of interviews with me, including a, a big spread in the New York Times, all because one of those videos conclusively showed that there was a U.S. senator um, by the time these videos came out, he was no longer a senator. But when he was a senator, he did not do anything in his capacity as a senator without getting guidance from the Mormon church. Um, and he was not even a senator from Utah where there's a lot of Mormons. He was a senator from a state that barely has any Mormons to begin with. So it was, um, you know, it was, it's one of those things where, you know, it's really hard to get, get, these religions on their influence because they'll deny deny and there's there's almost there's rarely like definitive proof but there was a case where it was like from the horse's mouth they were actually talking about it you know where they couldn't you know they couldn't deny it any <laughs> anymore type of a thing um are you, are you, so yeah the the political are you at liberty to reveal the name of that ex-senator senator yeah yeah his name was in the video and everything his oh. name um uh gordon smith 
Gordon Smith out of Oregon. He was a senator in Oregon. Um, and the video, um, which is on the Mormon Leaks YouTube page, people can go and find it there. There's not a lot of videos on that page. They can easily go find the one with Gordon Smith in the title. Um, it's the only one. And it's a long, really boring video, so good luck to anybody who has actually wants to watch it <laughs> but uh uh the video was actually after he had left office and he went to go and meet with these you know powerful you know the top leaders uh that run the church and basically kind of like a debriefing of hey you know i just left the senate and had a great time and this is all the great things we did together type of a thing and he it's actually talked in there about how there was a six-week period where his staff didn't know what to do on a particular issue because they hadn't heard back from the church yet. Oh, wow. That's... <laughs> yeah. And, and he says other things as well that are, you know, somewhat, you know, incriminating, if you will, um, in, in regards to the church having influence over him. And, and one of the things that I always say when talking about those videos, you know, if he had been a senator from Utah, where uh, the majority of the residents of Utah are Mormons and and probably would agree with maybe the direction the church wanted a politician to go in, it, it would be a little bit more forgiving. I'm not saying it would be totally forgivable, but it would be a little bit more understanding because you could make the argument that, hey, well, the Mormon church kind of represents my largest constituency. You know what I'm saying? But in this case, he was from Oregon, which I, I, I believe there's less than like 2% of, of the state of Oregon are Mormons. And he's there taking you know direction from the Mormon church. I think you're a lot more forgiving than I because I would suggest... Well, that, I, I have, yeah. Uh, no, that's, that, that's probably understandable. I'm not, it's not even a knock on you. Yeah. You're probably a better person for right, it right. in general. But I would suggest that even if I have is, my I have my moments. Yeah, he obviously a, a senator from uh, Utah would have to represent the people of Utah, but also has to vote on yeah. laws that everyone has to live by, and you have a responsibility sure. to 300 million people, not just a few people in Utah. I would suggest that separation of church and state is a phenomenally important thing, and having literally yeah. having the staff of a senator having to wait weeks to decide to hear back from the church, that's not the way for a modern nation to run. That's a really backward, okay. uh, negative thing. Let's just put it that way. Again, don't want to get anyone into yeah. any legal problems. Let's just say <laughs> negative. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. And, and, you know, if I, I do try to, especially on the stuff that we report on, I do try to sort of frame things in the, in the most fair way possible. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I agree. I think the criticism that you're leveling, I think is not only valid, I, I probably agree with it. Um, and, um, unfortunately I, I do, uh, the reality though is, I mean, the, the reality is, if that had been a senator from Utah, I'm not so sure the New York Times would have covered the story. Probably. I can't say that for sure, but I'm not sure how how interesting it would have been if he had been a an, a, a senator from Utah who's basically whether he hears it from the Mormon Church or not is probably voting in line with his constituents anyway. Yeah. Well, you exactly, I mean? yeah. Because I mean, if you publish a story, senator from Utah takes lead from that church, then people just go, yeah, well, of course he does. Like that, that wouldn't mm -hmm. be particularly shocking, um, as much as it still right. should be. It still should be, right? Yeah, it still, it should, still be, yeah. should be. But it is. Yes. Um, so uh, Tracy hasn't talked much uh, in this, um, so I, I'd like to, if we can, give her a go. Give pivot her a go. completely away from anything we've talked about so far. Um, to, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the, uh, your previous involvement with the ACA and all of that. Um, have there been any developments in that? How do you have you been keeping an eye on your former? Um... I really haven't, um, oh, okay. to be honest. I, I I've been using hashtag glad I left, um, and you know anytime somebody there are you know every now and then somebody will come knocking on my door, my cyber door, to say this or that has occurred, uh, and I'm just like yeah, not surprised. Glad I left. Um, it's I. I I think um, I've not heard anything positive about it improving or getting better, and um, most of what I hear is more of the same. So, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't. I have nothing. Nothing salacious for you. You know, I've, no, I've, I've moved I've, on with my life and the projects. And 
Absolutely. I don't mind you asking, but I just don't have any news. No, absolutely. I was just because I, I uh, like yourself, have just heard a continuation of potential negatives and all the rest, which is a shame, a real shame. Yeah, I do know they've, they've uh, one of the they had relaunched, I guess, um, GB right. The Godless Bitches had relaunched, and I, I think they've already lost one of those hosts again. Um, I, I don't know any specifics about it other than there was a statement issued publicly that um, there was like a moral disagreement on something, but there, it was pretty vague. Oh, okay. So have you got any uh, new projects upcoming yourself in terms of broadcasting or anything? Um, I do. I mean, it's nothing that I'm really pushing, but I have I have got, went ahead and opened a blog um, at WordPress, and it's it's under At Home in My Head, which has an accompanying podcast and um, also an accompanying uh, YouTube channel, which they all mirror. They all mirror the same content. The blog itself is sort of that content plus a bunch of really personal stuff about just my day to day life. So it's it's um and I. I I don't mean it to sound um, like I think my daily life is interesting, but it's sort of, I guess, think of it in terms of like, this is where I'm journaling. And if anybody finds it interesting, they're welcome to, you know, be there and see it. But um, I don't expect that uh, it should be interesting to people. It's just if they share an interest in some of the things I'm interested in, that's fine. It's like a lot of house renovation and gardening stuff and cooking and just things I'm, I'm into. Well, you should have told me about that, because that's not linked below at the moment, but it will be as soon as we get off air, and I'll get those links, and they will be underneath the Okay, video. like I said, it's it's not like I'm promoting it as like a huge thing that would be of interest to atheists or anything like that. It's strictly just my project for me, sort of my fun thing that I do, and it, it has, I, I, the, the podcast and the YouTube channel do sort of have... Um, the, are extracting the content that might be more of interest to an atheist community. Like there's several episodes on indoctrination and then there's like a new series that's going about um, perspectives on death that has to do with sort of my perspective from a secular standpoint and how I've dealt with different people who have died um, in my life and things like that. But, but it's, but it's a lot more personal stuff. And so a person would have to kind of um, be interested in that as opposed to overall, um, atheist, just sterile atheist issues. Well, and I don't even, I, I've gone to non-theist, I don't even really use atheist anymore as a self-label, but... Yeah, that's fair enough. But I mean, I, I, you might not want to push it, but now I'm going to, just to be <laughs> slightly annoying, I think. Anyway, um, so yeah, go and go and check that out, um, if you're watching this in the future, and it'll be linked underneath. Um, any final thoughts? Anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to talk about at all? I just I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to get the word out to a larger audience. I just really appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, well, yeah, I, yeah go on, sir. Oh, I was just gonna yeah echo what Tracy said. Uh, really appreciate it. The more we can get our word the word out, the the better people are off. And if anybody can you know spare a few dollars and throw it our way, uh, reach out to me. I'm pretty accessible. You know, the contact information is on the website. Reach out to me if you have questions. I'll do my best to, to give you a full and complete answer. Awesome, yeah, and I'll uh, I'll try and uh, poke a few um, well-known YouTubers to share links out and things as well. Uh, Appreciate that's, that. that. That's 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 an off the air thing. Um, yes, so uh, <laughs> thank you both for for coming on. This is a a really um, important issue, and I hope I I wish you all the best with a raising the money and b with the law. So because like I say. Even yeah. if you were to somehow lose that lawsuit, I would suggest that the problem would be with the law rather than the righteousness of your case. Even though righteousness is well, a and we'll, weird we'll way definitely of we'll, we'll be reaching out again, I think, to folks to sort of give them an update on what occurs or doesn't occur. Like I said, it's um, right now we're we're a little concerned about the way the the GoFundMe is going, um, but you know, it's there is a plan B um, if if we have to work, I guess, to either take down information or to revise information or whatever but um, obviously for obvious reasons we would like to be able to challenge this have you considered bank robbery i hear that's quite lucrative <laughs> <laughs> that's again yeah that is, that is a joke <laughs> that is just <laughs> anyway but, th but thank you uh, both enormously for coming on and uh, i wish you all the best the links thank are you, below Kevin. to everyone uh, please go and give as generously as you can, but if you're not able to, um, then by all means share the links around. 
hopefully we can uh, we can allow these people to fight this lawsuit, which is incredibly important. Um, thank you both, and thank you to everyone for watching. Um, I will see you all later. Have, enjoy the rest of your day.